about one of the, uh, one of the subfamilies in the Lagrioid branch. So if you remember, this Lagrioid branch is a lineage of Tenebrianas that's mostly found in tropical forested habitats, um, unlike those other ones that we've seen from the deserts. And currently there's two subfamilies that we recognize within this Lagrioid branch, or no, there's three subfamilies the Frina Patini and Lagriini, but also if you think back to yesterday's um, diaporine talk, we talked, we mentioned that that third subfamily, Milionini, doesn't belong in this branch. Um, and so diagnosing this branch of Tenebrionidae is a bit tricky. Their labrum is subquadrate to elongate shape. Um, and Tenny only has simple sensilla, but you know, that's true for a lot of these Tenebrionidae we, we looked at. The Ediagus isn't inverted, so that rule, that's how it's distinguished from the whole Pimelioid branch that we talked about, but um, there's an exception to that rule, unfortunately, in Lagrians as well. Um, and the intersegmental membrane of those terminal and term abdominal sternites is usually present. And the defensive glands, they're either present or absent, and the Lagriini in particular shows a fairly high diversity of defensive gland forms. Um, so within that, we talked about the Frina Patini yesterday. Um, Pat talked about that subfamily. Um, and today I'm gonna cover the Lagriini. So the Lagriini is much more diverse than the Frina Patini. There's roughly 348 genera with 3,600 species globally distributed. And although they're super diverse in the tropics, the diversity in the US and Canada is, is very, very low. Um, so in today's talk, I'm actually going to introduce you to the global diversity of this um, subfamily. And you know, in terms of diagnosis, their diagnosis isn't too different from that for the Lagrioid branch. And yeah, if you want to know how to distinguish it from the Frina Patini, just look at yesterday's talk from Pat to see the unique characters that the Frina Patines had, which are absent in the Lagrioids. Um, so the very first talk on Monday, um, um, Marcin sort of shared how, as we apply molecular phylogenetic tools to Tenebrionidae, it's sort of revising our tribal concepts. And um, like the Blaptini that he talked about, the Lagrians is also a group that um, I've been working on to use sort of these molecular tools to clarify the relationships and also clarify the tribal boundaries within this um, group. So we do have a molecular phylogeny with all of the tribes. And we've been using this molecular phylogeny to um, revise sort of the tribal classification of the subfamily. So Rolf and a few of us have reinstated Eschatoporiini. So this is, a G this is a tribe which would be absent from American beetles. This Eschatoporis will key out as a Goniaterini if you use that key. And um, we've also, and I've also used this phylogeny to sort of uh, revise the concepts of this one tribe, which doesn't occur in um, the US, Lenini. But I'll touch on this because it turns out this tribe does get into North America, even if not into the US and Canada. Um, so, however, with these phylogenetic analyses, there is one part of the tree which is still kind of a mess. And um, that Consider, concerns these two tribes right here, the Goniaterini and the Lupropini. And the issue with these two tribes is that, okay, there is a core clade that we can call the Lupropini and a core clade for the Goniaterini, but there's this third group of Lagriine tenebs, um, which has a mix of taxa, which are currently classified in those two tribes. So um, some of the classification which I'll be sharing with you is from a paper that Rolf is leading that we're really close to finishing and submitting. Um, that's, so the classification is then the tribal classification I'm sharing with you isn't necessarily gonna reflect what is currently published, but you know, this data will soon be out there. Um, so one of the cool things about the Lagriini is that they have 
a high diversity of um, defensive gland types. So we've talked a lot about these seven, eight paired glands within the tenebrionoid branch, but within lagrions, we also see one tribe, the Adeliani, which has these um, really long defensive glands that actually come out between the sternites eight and nine. And yeah, th so this is a tribe that's restricted to um, the Gondwanan region. And yeah, they invert these and sort of drag them behind their bodies when they're threatened. And there's also a unique case, the Pycnocerini, where they only have a single gland reservoir that opens up between segments seven and eight. So whether, so it's hypothesized that in the subfamily, glands might have originated um, multiple times, unlike the tenebrionoid branch where it's thought to be a single origin. Um, another character that I'm going to be touching on to help distinguish tribes, um, and this is going to be extremely relevant for distinguishing some of the North American taxa, is the closure of the mesococcal cavity. And this is a character that you also see frequently in other groups of beetles as well. But um, just to clarify this character, again, when we say the mesococcal cavity is open, here's an open state, that means that you could clearly see the trochanton. You he have right here the mesoventrite and metaventrite, and they don't touch. And you have the mesepimeron sort of separating the two. And then the closed state, which is going to be really important for distinguishing this tribe, um, Pratiaini, which is, isn't published yet, but this is the one that we're going to be proposing and soon. It's the closed state where the trochanton isn't very visible and the um, ventrites touch. But again, if you remember from the talk um, from yesterday's diaporine talk, the, the character is a bit hard to interpret sometimes because if you actually smooshed your specimen or ethanol got in and um, caused it to distend, that junction can um, sort of get decoupled as you can see here, where it actually kind of looks like the mesopimeron is, um, mesopisternum is, or sorry, mesopimeron is between the two sternites. But um, if you look at it and there's this thickening in the arm of the ventrite here and here, that is a usually a good indication that when the specimen hadn't been smooshed or distended that they were meeting together. Um, Okay, so now let's just go through the tribes. Um, Cosifini, this is a tribe that unfortunately we don't get in North America. The pie dish beetles, um, similar to the pie dish beetles in appearance in Australia. But um, so this is a tribe that occurs in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. There's only two genera, Cosifus and Endostomus, which are really easy to distinguish because in Cosifus, you can see the underside of the head and Endostomus, the underside of the head is also covered. So um, you can now go to your collections and quickly sort those two genera out. Um, one unique feature about this tribe um, is that their Abdominal sternites are actually more similar to the Pimeliini, so there actually is no visible membrane and uh, um, between the terminal ventrites. But all the other la labrum and ovipositor characters clearly put it within the Lagriini. And there are keys to the species of Cosifus, but um, endostomus is currently being revised. Bellopini, this is a tribe that we actually do get in the US. And again, this tribe is also unique in the Lagrians in that they also have those similar Pimelian characters of abdominal sternites lacking visible membranes. And also the Ediagus is inverted, I believe, in this tribe. Um, it includes some fairly normal kind of dramia tenib kind of looking tenibs, but um, there's also a lot, especially in Australia, of um, termitophilus, myrmecophilus forms with bizarre antennal modifications as well. And in the US, we have two genera, Adelonia and Ripaz. In North America, we have two genera, 
um, Adelonia and Ripasma, and they also both occur in the US. So in Texas, you have Adelonia sulcata. Again, looks kind of tenebrae, but it has um, femoral spines. It's a wind species. Um, Ovipositor is Lagrian type. And there's this, there is a species of Ripasma as well. And this is kind of interesting because um, if you have American beetles, this won't be in it. Um, it was, um, it was identified from the U.S. post American beetles, but um, we actually, I don't think we actually know what species this is yet. It occurs down in southern Texas, um, between Brownsville and a bit north of that. It's very abundant in the leaf litter down there. Actually, it's, um, very very common. They collected. Um, the next tribe I want to talk about, which also occurs in the U.S. and only in the U.S., is the Ashado Porini. This is a tribe that um, Ralph Albu, me, and Aaron, we kind of reinstated based on molecular data. Um, so this is a really cool group of completely blind or, you know, the, just one or two facets with one or two facets. Um, these beetles are only known from Marin County and Sonoma County in California. And this, the species, Noonan Ishadopores, Noonan Makarai, is um, only known from sort of rock cracks, interstitial habitats. And Ishadopores Styx, which we described, is only known from a single cave in Sonoma County. Um, they're very distinct looking, long, you know, just lots of adaptations for living in that kind of habitat. And sort of the um, synapomorphy that unites this group is that we've been talking about abdominal gland, sternite glands, but this thing on the tergites, so here's tergite seven. So instead of the ventrites, now we're talking about the dorsal abdominal segments. They have these large kind of um, large sacs, which, you know, if I didn't label this T7, this just looks like standard sternal defensive gland reservoirs, but we don't know what the function of these are. We don't know if it's defensive or something else, but they're there. Um, and another kind of cool tidbit about this tribe is that they are strongly supported as being sister to the Adeliaini, which I will talk about next. And that's really strange because here's a beetle that's only known from sort of these um, obscure habitats in California, sister to a uh, classic, classic Gondwanan group, the Adeliaini. So this is a tribe which occurs in all throughout the Austral Australasian region, extremely diverse in um, Australia and New Zealand with a few species that get into Madagascar and um, Southern Chile, but um, nowhere else. There is a species from Ecuador that was classified within this tribe, but that was an error. So the Adelians, again, I talked about this a bit earlier, they're unique in that they have these paired glands between um, abdominal sternites eight and nine, these really long glands. And there's also many, many forms that are very, very carabid-like, um, often get mixed up for terostokines and things. And there's a great generic key that's published to the Australian fauna as well. And there's a key to the Malagasy species, but the Chilean ones need to be looked at more carefully. Um, moving on, now we're gonna talk about the Lagri Ini. So this is, in terms of generic and species diversity, this is the largest tribe within the Lagri Ini subfamily. And um, currently there's, this tribe is classified into two subtribes, but um, we're soon going to be including another subtribe in here as well. And so the two, the two subtribes that are recognized now are the Staturina and the Lagriina. And in the US, we have two genera of Staturines, um, Statara and Arthromacra, and 11 more genera, 11 genera in the whole continent. The Lagriina do not natively occur in the Americas, but there is an introduced species which is all throughout South America right now, Lagria hirta. And I, it, occasionally I've seen it in my last year looking at some of the intercepts, um, but 
yeah, it's probably only a matter of time before it comes over here. And the third tribe, which again, in the published literature, it isn't recognized yet, but we'll be publishing this shortly, is the Fobeli Aina. So Fobelius right here, which is currently classified in the Goniaderini. Um, this subtribe has two genera in Mexico, Central and South America. So yeah, diagnosing the Lagriini is really easy. Many species have really long terminal antennomeres, um, but it's not a universal character, but most of them do. And in fact, all the ones in the US have this character. And also the pronotum um, does not have a distinct lateral margin as well. And these are chemically defended and they usually have these really small um, paired glands that come out between sternites seven and eight. Distinguishing the subtribes is also very easy. So you can quickly sort your undead um, international material based on these characters. So the Staturina, the antennae are more filiform in shape, and all Staturina have this sort of expanded terminal antennomere um, in both the males and the females. And also, if you look at the prosternal process, um, the prosternum are you know, normally separated and the prosternal uh, process looks fairly normal. And to contrast with that, in the Lagriini, the antennae tend to be stouter. And most of the species do have that um, elongate terminal antennomere characters, but there are species, and especially the females of some species where it's not evident at all. But the main character you can use to identify this subtribe is that the prosternal process is um, either very, very thin or you know, totally non-existent. And thus the procoxy um, cavities seem to be continuous. And also because of that, the procoxy tend to be more bulging as well. And now this um, third tribe that, that it's not published yet, but we'll be recognizing soon is going to be the Fobeliina. So if you look at it dorsally, it kind of resembles the Lagriina and none of the so this subtribe only contains um, two genera from uh, the tropics in the Americas, but none of the species have that expanded terminal antennomere. However, the, pro the pronotum is la lacking the lateral margins. And although it looks like very similar to the Lagriina, if you flip it over and look at the prosternal process, the prosternal process is more similar to the Staturina. So it kind of has a mix of characters found in the two currently recognized subtribes. Looking at the diversity in the US and Canada, again, only two genera, Arthromacra, which can be distinguished by the lack of striae, includes um, some really, really pretty specimen species. This is um, Arthromacra robinsoni, which should be active this time of the year in um, central Virginia. And there's only three species in this genus. Arthromacra is a whole Arctic group and there are species from Japan that also look like this. And then Statyra, which is a very, very diverse genus with hundreds of species, um, only 15 in the US, which can try to key out using this key by Parsons, but it relies heavily on a uh, number of CD in various intervals. And often with older specimens, those CD aren't there. So now you're counting pores which used to contain CD, it's, it can be fairly tricky, but um, this can, the genera can be distinguished because the Tara has very distinct, distinct striae. Um, another tribe that doesn't occur in the US, Carodini. This is a very, I don't know, a scarab form tenebrionid, which is found in the beaches of Australia and New Zealand. Um, similar to some of the diaparines we looked at Yesterday, Filaria and Trachycelis. It has fossorial arms for that lifestyle. It has very reduced ovipositors and very compact antennae with clubs. These don't have defensive glands. Um, and now I want to talk about sort of these um, three tribes that are colored on this tree that I mentioned in earlier on, the Goniaderini, the Lupropini, 
and this tribe, which we're going to be naming soon, the Pratyaini. So right now, if you take the taxa in American beetles and the catalog of North American Tenebrionidae and try to write a diagnosis for Goniaterini, this is what you would have to say. The body is small to large. Eyes are either partially divided by the canthus or nearly rounded. Antenna with a weak club or without a club. Um, the mesococcal cavity, so this is just the mesococcal cavities are closed or open. Chemical defensive glands present or absent, ovipositor, stout, and elongate. So in this diagnosis, you see a lot of characters that we've been previously using for diagnosing tribes, and they're just super variable. If you look at the lupropini, it's the exact same diagnosis. So something's gotta give or we can't diagnose these tribes. Luckily though, when we see how these genera sort of fell out in the molecular phylogeny, um, they became a bit more diagnosable. So the diagnoses I'm gonna that I'm gonna provide for you is based on the revised classification of these tribes, which again, will soon be in, um, will be in a man manuscript that we're getting ready to submit. So the Goniaterini, they're still small to large beetles, but um, this is a group that is abundant in leaf litter or under bark in trees. And again, very diverse in tropical habitats. And in North America, um, we, will, we have four genera right now, Anidus, Goniatera, Phymatestes, and Xanthicles. Um, and once this paper comes out, there'll be a few more added as well. In the US and Canada, there's only a single genus right now, Anidus with five species. And the most common one, especially um, out east, is this Anidus brunius, which is fairly abundant in leaf litter. So, you know, we had this really vague diagnosis um, before, but if we restrict it to the taxa that were recovered in that clade and the phylogeny, oops, oh no, where did it go? Sorry, hold on. Huh. Okay, I'll live do this. this there's something happened with one of my slides. Um, sorry about that. Oops. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, I accidentally grabbed something. Sorry about that. So, okay. Goniaterini in the old sense, very, very vague. But if we look in the new sense, okay, so the body size is still small to large. Um, for the second character, eyes partially divided or not. Now in the new sense, they're all, they all have our eyes that are partially divided by the canthus. Antennal character, none of them have clubs, so we could now delete this. Mesococcal cavities, they're all open in this group. Chemical defensive glands, they're all absent in this group. And the ovipositor is stout. So there, in the new sense of the Goniaterani, that's how you can diagnose this tribe. Um, now looking at the Lupropini in the new sense. So these are now small to medium um, lagrions that are that they don't occur in North America in, in the Americas right now, but um, there is this one species, Luprops tristis, which can lives in um, India, which can explode in numbers occasionally. And this is fairly common in intercepts from India. Um, and you know it in all honesty probably could establish in Florida very easily. Um, it's found in similar climates over there. Um, so again, in the old sense, this tribe is very hard to diagnose, but in the new sense, okay, so the body is small to medium, the eyes like the goniaterini are partially divided by acanthus, the antennae like the goniaterini lack clubs and the mesococci is open, but these are distinguished by having chemical defensive gland reservoirs. And unfortunately, we have spent a lot of time studying these genera and this really, this. It is a major character, 
but it is obscure to study sometimes, but this seems to be the only major distinction in those tribes. Um, that and the ovipositor as well, which is also a really hard character to study in dried material. Um, so that leaves us with this clade, which currently in the literature does not have a name, but we're gonna be naming the Pratiaini. And this contains um, small to medium beetles that are very, very common in leaf litter, tree holes, and um, even found in some in beach rack in some parts of the world. And in the U North America, we have two genera, Peritonitis and Pratius. And in the literature, um, you'll see this name Laurelis as well, but we're gonna be synonymizing this with Pratius in this paper that we're working on. Um, so Pratius and Peritonitis, they could be distinguished by just looking at the pronotums. Pratius has um, lateral margins of the pronotum not crenulate, and then Peritonitis, they're really, really bumpy. Again, um, if we wanna diagnose this tribe, the bodies are small to moderate. In this group, the eyes are nearly rounded. The antennae have a club. Um, the mesococcal cavities are closed, but they don't have chemical defensive glands and the ovipositors are elongate. So, so yeah. Um, so that's, those are the only tribe, those are, that covers the diversity of what can be found in North America, but there are a couple other remaining tribes to talk about from the global diversity. Um, so you have the Pycnocerini, which are these large bodied um, beetles that are very, very diverse in Sub-Saharan Africa um, in the tropical regions of that. But there are also a few species that make it into Southeast Asia as well. And this was the tribe that has um, a single gland reservoir between sternites seven and eight. And some of them have very kind of pasalid form bodies. And finally, um, the Lenini, which doesn't occur in the US and Canada and is currently in the published literature, not known from North America. But this is a predominantly old world tribe um, that's characterized by lacking wings and they have really small rounded eyes. Um, they're currently known from South America. So here's Plastica polida from South America. But there's also a couple of undescribed species in this genus Ketylus, which makes it into Panama as well. So, yep. So, yeah. In summary, the US and Canadian diversity of Lagriani is pretty much here. Um, it's not very diverse in the US and Canada, but the further south you go, the more it picks up. And that's about all I have to say. Any questions?